Welcome to ABC News 4 at 6. I'm Katie Solt. We have new details tonight regarding the South Carolina woman living in New Orleans who died under mysterious circumstances. 21 year old Kaya Whetstone is from Bamberg County. Authorities say she was picked up by an Uber driver early Saturday morning. Hours later, she was dropped off at a New Orleans hospital and pronounced dead on arrival. Ann Emerson spoke exclusively with Kaya's extended family today, and it's a story you'll only see here on ABC News 4. So, Ann, do they know what happened to Kaya yet? Katie, no. I spoke to two of her cousins who were very close to Kaya. All they know is that Kaya was Snapchatting with friends at a Mardi Gras parade on Friday night. She climbed into an Uber and then nothing. She had been at the Mardi Gras parade um, and there's just a big time gap until then when he dropped her off. So I just, we don't really know. I just pray she didn't suffer and I just hope we get the justice she deserves. The Sutton sisters grew up with Kaya in Little Swamp in Bamberg County. Grace was one of Kaya's best friends. It was Saturday when she received the call that Kaya was gone. I just asked God why, 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 why her? And um, I just still feel so numb. Kaya's last text message to Grace was just two days before she died. In it, Kaya told Grace, You've been on my mind heavy lately. Maybe it's a sign from God, but I wanted to let you know I miss you so much, and I'm so proud of you and thankful that you're always been by my side. I'll never stop loving you and send a heart. And that was the last message that we had sent back and forth. The Sutton sisters both say Kaya was living her best life as a psychology student at the University of New Orleans, set to graduate next year. She loved it there. She's, I've never seen her happier in her entire life than she has been since she's been there. She was just the most perfect friend and best cousin. I've, I'm sorry if I get choked up. And best cousin, um, we were the same age, and she always would talk to me when I needed her. She never met a stranger, loved everyone, and was the most fearless person I've ever met. She had the strongest relationship with God. We've requested the police report from New Orleans, and we're waiting on an autopsy and a full coroner's report into Kaya's death. Working for you, Ann Emerson, ABC News 4. Kaya's stepfather, Chris Ferrand, posted a statement on Facebook which says in part, quote, I want to wait on an official police report and coroner's report before I make any kind of statement regarding any events. At that point, I'll answer any questions as long as it doesn't interfere with any investigations that may follow. Right now, my concern is getting Kaya home so we can lay our angel to rest, end quote. Today, the family of Jamal Sutherland stood on the steps of the state house with at least two lawmakers by their side. They're calling for a change in the mm -hmm. state law and justice for their son, who died after being tased repeatedly in jail. He was supposed to be in a mental health facility. Our Ann Emerson tells us about the two bills they're hoping to get passed, along with this hate crimes bill still sitting in the Senate. Ann? Well, there were three separate bills in front of lawmakers, and right now, bills that the Sutherlands believe if they were already laws might have prevented the death of their son Jamal. They came to Columbia to tell lawmakers in person. We're here for justice for Jamal. We're here because we want to see equity and transparency in our law enforcement system. And we want to make sure that that gets done through legislation. Representative Pendarvis is pushing his fellow state lawmakers to pass several bills at the moment. The first, a mental health bill, which requires law enforcement to provide an evaluation after the arrest from a mental health facility. Jamal died in police custody after being arrested at a mental health facility for a misdemeanor assault. The second is called the Jamal Sutherland Act. It prohibits the use of excessive force when detaining a person. Right now, there is no excessive force statute on the books. That question is, why don't we? We should make sure that we're giving our prosecutors every tool in the toolkit in order for them to prosecute the crimes that are out there. Then, and so that's what 4406 does. It, it puts and it codifies excessive force. We need the state to become more active in the lives of everybody, just not their people. We are all people of God, so that we need to all come together and do the right thing. There's also a hate crimes bill. It's stalled in the Senate after passing through the House last April. South Carolina is one of only two states that don't have a hate crimes law. Pass the bill, South Carolina. Amen. Not only for 
our family, because we can't bring Jamal back, but for other families so that they won't have to deal with these types of tragedies. After the press conference, the group, including the Sutherlands, said they would hand deliver a letter to the South Carolina Attorney General's office asking him to appoint a special prosecutor in the killing of Jamal Sutherland. Working for you, Ann Emerson, ABC News 4. All right, thank you, Ann. In July 2021, Ninth Circuit Court solicitor Scarlett Wilson decided not to prosecute the Charleston County Sheriff's deputies involved in his death at their detention facility. Hundreds of thousands of dollars are poured into the Charleston County School District each year to ensure a cyber attack doesn't happen. And cyber attacks in schools are on the rise around the country. Now, in 2017, Dorchester District 2 was hit by a ransomware attack. That disabled the district's operating system and database on 25 mm -hmm. servers. Our Amy Russo is live in the newsroom tonight. And Amy, how often are attempts made on the district? Katie Tessa weekly. There are hundreds of attempts, but there is some good news so far. Nothing has gone through to the network, but I'm told officials they're preparing for the worst. $500,000. That's how much money the Charleston County School District has invested annually since 2017 to prevent cyber attacks. We have multiple appliances. One is a firewall and that basically monitors it's a traffic cop. Tom Naraki is the executive director of IT. He says a lot of money goes towards security awareness training for students, faculty, and staff. So I do several phishing attempts to all of our users at least once or twice a year. And it's a good thing he does. According to the K-12 Cybersecurity Resource Center, cyber attacks in schools are on the rise nationwide, up 18% in 2020. With over 120,000 devices on CCSD's network, a big IT team is needed to keep the hackers out. So our IT staff has about 45 individuals to cover all 75 schools, um, plus our, some of our charter schools, and we have roughly 25 contractors. Over a million emails come in every week. It's no surprise hacking attempts happen every day. We notice about three to 500 each week that are known threats or known phishing attacks that are then stopped by one of our appliances or softwares. So what are hackers looking for? Passwords and usernames, and they're looking for financial data um, or personal identifiable information. Naraki trains his IT department on what to do if a breach happens. Hire a third party to come in and simulate a ransomware attack or simulate um, somebody shutting down our systems and then preparing us for how do we, uh, how do we deal with that situation. Because he says it's not a matter of if it happens, but when. And I'm told even if an attack does occur, CCSD's data is stored in multiple places. So if they are hit, they should be able to retrieve the information that may be compromised.